Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar and thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, my name is uh, Justyna Pawasińska and I will be presenting to you about the EU regulate, regulatory landscape of cellular agriculture. Um, before we start, uh, I would like to let you know of a couple of things. First of all, the, the slides that you are about to see will be uh, shared with you uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, so feel free to make notes, but uh, no need to copy the entire content. Um, also, the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared with you as well. Um, in case you have any technical issues, uh, please use the chat function and we will, be, we will try to help you out there. And uh, finally, if you have any questions regarding the content of the, this presentation, please uh, include them in the questions and answer tab. I believe it should be either at the bottom of your screen or on the very top, um, or send me an email after the webinar and I will be very happy to follow up um, on that with you. So let's start. Let's start with um, a short, uh, well, uh, let's start with an agenda of what we will be, uh, what you will hear about today. Um, I will uh, start with a brief definition of cellular agriculture. Um, and this webinar is focused on uh, products that are not genetically modified. However, um, I will give some background on what is considered a genetically modified food and uh, also what is a novel food in the context of cellular agriculture. Um, also, what you will need to do to get your product to successfully onto the European market and uh, what should be taken into consideration already at the R&D stage to make this uh, journey as easy as possible. Um, and I will also cover some potential pitfalls and give some tips on how to, um, how to deal with them. Uh, and finally, I will mention uh, some additional aspects that will need to be considered before placing the food on the, on the European market. Um, after a quick recap, we will finish today's session with some questions and answers. Uh, some of these questions have been uh, asked uh, by, by you when signing up for the webinar, and I have included these within the presentation. Um, I will try to answer all of them, and also, uh, if time allows us, I will check the question and answer uh, tab to uh, address any questions that came up during this presentation. Um, let me just quickly check if there is any uh, information in the chat about people not hearing. Ah, sounds good. Looks good. Uh, looks like uh, no one is having any issues. So uh, let's start with let's start with the definition of cellular agriculture. Oh, uh, sorry. Let's start with the definition of cellular agriculture. Uh, basically, uh, cellular agriculture is using cells, replicating them in order to produce, produce substitutes for conventional agriculture. So uh, at the moment, the primary uh, research is revolving around uh, lab-grown meat, uh, as well as other animal products uh, like milk or, or, or eggs. Uh, however, uh, we are also, uh, or we can also see other innovative um, biomasses being um, developed at the moment. So, what is the first question you should ask yourself when uh, thinking about introducing a product onto the market? So, the, the key question from a regulatory perspective. Uh, so, has your food been produced? using genetical modifications. Um, the answer to this question 
may seem uh, quite straightforward. Um, however, um, in regulatory affairs, uh, there is very rarely such a thing as an easy question. Um, so let's move on to, uh, to, to, to the definition of a genetically modified food. So uh, genetically modified food uh, is a food produced from a GMO, but not a food produced with a GMO. Um, basically, the key factor here, or the key question here, is whether um, there is recombinant DNA present in the final food. If there, are, if, if the, if there is our DNA present in the final food, uh, then the follow-up question is, why and how much? So um, the, the reason for these questions is because um, the regulation does allow traces of genetically modified uh, material present in the food, as long as it's advantageous and technically unavoidable and not higher than 0.9%. Um, on the other hand, if the genetic material is present in the final food, um, then the food would be considered uh, uh, genetically modified, uh, a food produced from a genetically modified organism. So what if the food is not GMO? Uh, how will you get, uh, get it to your consumer? Uh, well, foods that haven't been consumed within the EU before 15th May 1997 are classified as novel foods. Um, and to be even more precise, um, there, there are different categories of, of foods within this regulation. And uh, cell-cultured uh, meat or cell-cultured products would fall under category six, uh, food consisting of, isolated from, or produced from cell culture, or tissue culture derived from animals, plants, microorganisms, fungi, or algae. Um, all novel foods uh, require a safety assessment and a pre-market authorization before they can be sold on the European market. So what does this uh, safety assessment entail? Uh, well, basically it means collecting um, data that can prove that uh, the product we, are, uh, we have developed is uh, safe and by compiling this information and submitting it to the uh, European authorities. The two, um, the two organs that are most involved in this evaluation is the European Commission and the European Food Safety Authority, um, which have uh, published a series of guidelines to help applicants um, compile such a, such a dossier uh, with sufficient information. Um, I will go through the actual process of, uh, of approval of a novel food a bit later in this presentation, but um, here, first I would like to focus on the actual data requirements. So as you can see, there are three parts of, the, of such a dossier, uh, the administrative part, the technical parts, and uh, related annexes. Uh, the bulk of the application um, and the most uh, difficult part is, the, is part two, the technical information. Um, so this part contains information on the characterization of the novel food. So identity, production process, compositional data, uh, specifications, uh, but also uh, includes specific safety studies that uh, may need to be provided. Uh, in the next few slides, as I mentioned, I will cover um, the, some of the requ data requirements that are necessary for a novel food application. Um, well, but uh, not, not part one or part three. That, uh, that we can do once you're closer to um, submitting an application. So uh, the first on the list is uh, quality uh, uh, from the quality data requirements is identity um, of the product. It is uh, very important here to provide as many, as uh, many details as possible 
um, because this uh, information would will be a solid solid basis for the later safety evaluation of the product. So we will need to uh, provide information on um, the source organism, its taxonomic information, origin, and the tissue that the cell was sampled from, uh, laboratory or culture collection sourced, a cell or tissue substrate used as a novel food, and type of the culture. Um, then the, the, the second step in the, um, in the application is uh, describing the production process. Um, this is important because, again, it will help uh, the European Food Safety Authority draw conclusions if um, any substances of concern may be present in the final product. So uh, that it, it is quite crucial here to, to describe uh, not only the cultural culture collect conditions and operational limits, uh, but also all the raw material that is used, um, including uh, all the reagents and extraction solvents and so on. Um, and uh, considering what could be the impurities, uh, potential contaminants or byproducts. Uh, one thing that is also worth considering is whether the production process uh, is novel. So um, again, uh, a novel production process would have the same definition or a similar definition to a novel food, which means a novel production process would be a process that has not been used within the EU uh, prior to 15th May 1997. Um, within uh, this section, uh, it's also important to provide any quality and safety systems put into place and specify the operational limits and uh, key parameters. Uh, and the, the third um, key part of describing of, uh, of identifying the, uh, the, the food, the cellular based food, is uh, the composition. It uh, discovers both the physical chemical, biochemical, microbiological uh, compos characterization, but also the nutrient profile. So uh, ash, moisture, protein, fat, carbohydrates, and other micronutrients that, uh, that are present in the food. Um, and in order to show the, um, in order to show the um, that the the food is uh, consistent within this co composition, the applicant will need to analyze five independently produced batches, um, which should be representative of the final product. Um, also, here it's important to note that. Um, the authorities want to see all the methods of analysis used. Ideally, these would be official methods, and if not uh, possible, if not available, um, you can also use in-house validated methods. Uh, but um, that means uh, you would need to provide the validation report. Um, within these method of analysis, uh, of course, you need to provide uh, the details of the method, the uh, limit of detection and quantification, as well as the certificates of analysis, and um, if possible, also uh, the accreditation certificate of the laboratory. Um, and defining the composition uh, will, on one hand, uh, help with uh, pointing out or, or discovering the, the potential um, byproducts or impurities, but also it will help uh, with designing the stability studies or the shelf uh, life studies of the product. So we finally get to uh, the safety uh, data requirements. Mm, this um, mainly consists of the ADNI, absorption, uh, digestion, metabolism and excretion, uh, and uh, toxicity studies. So um, EFSA recommends using EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, um, 
recommend uh, following a tiered approach. The first question that uh, should be asked is how is the food metabolized and is the substance absorbed? Um, if it is indeed absorbed, uh, then um, the applicant should move on to tier one uh, the, and, and carry out two in vitro genotoxicity studies and a 90 day subchronic toxicity study. And depending on the results of these studies, um, if any adverse effects are observed within tier one, um, the applicant may need to, to carry out additional uh, studies such as uh, in vivo genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, reproductive and prenatal development toxicity, and so on. So um, is it possible to avoid uh, carrying out these studies? Well, in theory, yes. So one, uh, one way or one approach is to demonstrate uh, no, that, that the food is not absorbed and argue that uh, or, or use the 3R approach. The 3R means uh, reduce, reuse and recycle. Uh, so reuse the information that's already uh, available. Um, also, the applicant could use uh, literature to support the safety of the food. But in this case, it is crucial that the food is very well defined uh, in the pre within the previous sections. And the level of unknown impurities is as low as possible. And also, there is a potential or there is a possibility to use alternative texts like QSAR or some omics techniques. So we know what safety studies to include, uh, but is there any way to design your product to limit potential safety concerns? Well, um, yes, there, there, um, there are certain steps that could be taken already at an earlier sta early stage while developing the product that could um, help you um, create a, a, a product that will be more likely approved um, by the European authorities. So we've spoken about um, impurities um, or other substances that are not the key, uh, key protein. These could include residues of the growth medium, um, uh, vitamins, minerals that could be above the safe levels, uh, side metabolites of the cells um, or allergenicity of novel proteins. So um, allergenicity may be a bit hard to or hard and expensive to, to evaluate um, at an early stage. Um, and also the food can be labeled uh, uh, correctly after it's introduced to the market. So this risk can be um, limited. However, the other, the, the, uh, the first few points um, can already be considered when uh, designing the food or designing the manufacturing process by looking at the uh, individual uh, materials that go into the, uh, into the production of the, of the final food and checking whether these could potentially be of concern. So if there are any um, any ingredients that uh, at high levels uh, can be um, potentially dangerous to or unsafe for humans. Um, so what uh, are the other um, potential pitfalls uh, that, that you could encounter uh, and how, um, how to, to avoid them? So the European Food Safety Authority um, has published several guidelines. Um, the key guidance in this case is the novel food guidance. Uh, however, it's very important to note that um, there are also several cross-sectional guidelines, um, such as for uh, toxicity or, um, uh, or for botanicals and, uh, or, or others that um, would be very useful uh, for the applicant to, on one hand, make sure that uh, the correct studies are planned, um, but also 
that the correct parameters are measured and that the results are interpreted in the right way. Another thing that is worth um, that, that is very important in the application is the identification of your food. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a detailed uh, a de detailed information on the identity of the food will allow uh, um, will give the authorities on one hand will give the authorities a better picture of your product and a better picture of what the potential um, safety risks could be. But on the other hand, it will also help you um, with the same questions and. Uh, if, if you already uh, are aware of potential safety concerns, then before submitting the application, you can already um, demonstrate that uh, hopefully there are no, uh, these are not of real concern or they don't, don't have a negative effect on, uh, on the human. Um, so I also mentioned before that uh, some um, data can be uh, provided or so some arguments can be provided via uh, literature um, and here it's important to note that there is actually a, a EFSA guidance on um, <clears throat> there's an EFSA guidance on how to how to prepare a comprehensive literature review um, which uh, should be followed um, but also it's very important to note that uh, when providing the outcome of this uh, review, it is very important to uh, to present the in, uh, the whole whole package, the whole information, both negative results and positive results. Um, and here you have the chance to show that perhaps the negative outcome of some studies are might are not applicable to your food. Um, I also mentioned that um, the, that it is possible to omit some data, uh, not provide them, but in case uh, you do so, um, you should provide a sound scientific justification for this. Um, my, um, my opinion is, or my uh, impression is that the scientific panel of the European Food Safety Authority is quite um, understanding when it comes to, um, or, or flexible when it comes to data that uh, that is provided. However, um, they will they will only agree to, to a different approach if there is a, um, a a strongly supported scientific uh, uh, evidence. Uh, another thing to, worth looking into when uh, preparing an application uh, are uh, some previous EFSA opinions. Uh, now, I do know that uh, to, up, to, up till now, there have been no applications for cellular agriculture products. Uh, however, um, this, even though it is still worth looking at other opinions and checking in what has been accepted for other types of products or how, um, what kind of arguments the applicants used for other um, or for, for some of their requirements uh, or what studies were carried out or, uh, and, and so on and so on. Finally, um, all of this might be, uh, well, it might be quite a lot because it's, it might be difficult to, to browse through or to identify all the uh, guidelines to make sure you've uh, looked under every rock and uh, uh, identified all the potential pitfalls. So um, in some cases, it, it can be advised to uh, use an external consultant that's an expert in the field um, of, of novel foods or in general of food legislation. Uh, and finally, uh, easy to say, um, providing an, a high, high quality dossier which is consistent and coherent and, uh, and clear. Um, Yes, so now um, that we know 
how to um, compile a dossier or, or we know what are the data requirements for a dossier, um, for a novel food dossier, what, what do we do next? Um, well, now the time has come to submit our application to, to the European authorities. So the application can be submitted via an, an electronic portal uh, to the European Commission. And now the European Commission um, will um, validate the application. So confirm that indeed the food that you are applying for, uh, for the authorization of, uh, indeed falls within the scope of the novel food regulation. If it does, in most cases, the European Commission will say that um, will request a risk assessment for this food uh, and will issue a mandate and uh, forward the application to the European Food Safety Authority. Now the European Food Safety Authority will uh, carry out a completeness check. Uh, this is more of an administrative check to make sure that all information that is, uh, is key uh, has been provided and that are, there are no glaring gaps. And once this is confirmed, uh, the European Food Safety Authority or EFSA, uh, they uh, begin the scientific review of the application. So the scientific review uh, lasts, or the, the, the authority has nine months to, to perform the scientific review. However, during this time, um, the authority or the scientific panel may ask the applicant additional questions, uh, questions or clarifications or request additional studies. Um, this is what uh, we call a clock stop. We call it that because at the time that EFSA requests additional information, the um, evaluation clock stops and until the applicant provides an answer to to FSS concerns, um, the clock is on hold. Once, uh, all, once the information is submitted, the clock restart, well, re it starts back. So it's not that you have to wait another nine months, but it takes, uh, takes on from where, from when it stopped. Um, and after the, this, this time, once, uh, once the, uh, safe, the uh, European Food Safety Authority reaches a conclusion, they publish an opinion, which is then forwarded to the European Commission again. Um, and now the European Commission um, evaluates this uh, scientific opinion as well as um, uh, the, the whole dossier that has been provided uh, and prepares a draft uh, implementing regulation. Uh, this uh, draft is then forwarded to the Scientific Committee on Plants, Animals, Food and Feed. Um, it's discussed there and finally the product can be authorized. Um, so the whole process is actually, may actually seem quite time consuming because in uh, the perfect scenario, the time to, from submission to approval is approximately one and a half years. Um, and considering the potential clock stops, in most cases, it will last longer. From what we've seen, um, most applications receive at least one clock stop, if not two, uh, during, the, during the evaluation process. So, um, so, so, um, what in parallel or, uh, so another thing that, that needs to be considered and actually, uh, questions that are asked by many food, um, manufacturers when, um, when they consider applying for a novel food authorization is the IP protection. So what happens to the food once uh, the uh, authorizing regulation is published? Uh, the food is listed on the union list of novel foods. 
Now, in this list, uh, we can see the exact specifications of the food and, uh, and also, in some cases, a brief description of the manufacturing process. Uh, and in, in theory, uh, any uh, manufacturer who s uh, complies with these specifications uh, can um, sell their product on the, on the European market, taking advantage of this authorization. Furthermore, um, in March 2021, uh, so next year, um, a new transparency regulation will uh, apply, which, um, which means that uh, applications that have been submitted after this um, after this, uh, this, uh, this date um, will be publicly available to the uh, will be publicly avail available uh, will be publicly available um, and also um, any co uh, communication with the European authorities a summary of those communications will also be publicly available uh, of course uh, or, or Luckily, uh, we are still able to request some information to be uh, claimed as confidential. Uh, and this information will actually not be, well, it will not be included in these public documents. The applicant will actually be requested to prepare two versions of the application, one with confidential information and one full application, uh, one without confidential information. Mm. What uh, is also important to know is that um, even though, um, what, if, despite of what I just said, the, the applicant does have um, a possibility for protection of their, uh, of their food. So <clears throat> um, any new unpublished scientific evidence um, or that has been uh, that has been essential to the conclusion of, on the safety of the novel food can be claimed as proprietary data, uh, and um, thanks to that, the applicant may request a five-year protection of their of their food, which means that during the first five years of after the authorization of the food, uh, only the the first applicant can sell the food on the market. After these five years, um, the, the, the competitors can take advantage of, um, of this authorization. However, as I mentioned, they will have to comply with all the specifications that are listed in the union list. So um, in order to um, make it harder for the competitors to piggyback on uh, your authorization, um, there are a couple uh, tricks um, to, to, yeah, to make it harder. Um, one of them would be to include very narrow specifications of your food um, so that it, yes, it, is, it, it takes more effort for the competitor to develop a food that is exactly the same. And similarly, include some, a brief uh, summary of the manufacturing process uh, which will also lock your food to a specific um, production process. Mm. So, if everything goes well, uh, the food is authorized. Uh, so, what now? Can you go ahead and uh, sell the product in, uh, in the EU? Well, almost. So, before um, entering the market, uh, you will need to register as a food business operator uh, in, in one of the European countries. Um, and also, you will have to have a label that is compliant with the EU law. But also, worth uh, keeping in mind is uh, that individual member states may have their own um, stricter laws when it comes to labeling. Um, some interesting uh, discussions that, uh, that I am actually looking forward to are discussions about the product name. 
uh, you may be aware about the um, about the discussions on uh, the the legal name of plant-based um, meat substitutes. Uh, so I expect uh, to be a similar debate when it comes to cell-based uh, foods. Um, there are already plenty of, uh, of ideas. Um, well, let, let's see what happens. And also something to look forward to are potential claims on uh, the cellular agriculture products. Um, which uh, might be nutritional claims related to the nutri nutrient contact, or perhaps health claims, uh, both of which uh, also do need to be uh, authorized uh, in the EU. So um, with this uh, slide, I, will, I, I am ending my presentation. Just a short, uh, short recap of uh, what we've discussed. So, in the European Union, um, cell-based foods that are not produced from a genetically modified organism uh, fall under the definition of a novel food. Um, and this, this food has to be authorized uh, in the EU. And uh, the key aspect of the, of the assessment of the authorization is its safety. The safety is evaluated by the European Commission and the European Food Safety Authority and uh, will take approximately uh, one and a half to two and a half years. Um, it's important to keep in mind that as an applicant, you have the possibility to apply for five-year data protection, which gives you exclusive rights to sell the, the food uh, for the first five years from authorization. And finally, uh, something to, uh, or some food for thought uh, that you, that the, the, the manufacturers of cell-based products may already start uh, thinking about is that um, when you are developing the, the production process, uh, try to keep in mind uh, what is the effect of this process on the final product. What are the, what are, what are the residual substances? Uh, what are the uh, effects of uh, different uh, processing uh, techniques and so on. So thank you very much for, for bearing with me. Um, I will now uh, carry on to, uh, to the questions and answers. Um, I've seen that uh, we've received quite a few uh, questions uh, already from, from the audience. Thank you very much for them. Uh, at the moment, um, I will, uh, well, or I will actually start with questions that have uh, been uh, submitted beforehand, before the webinar started with, uh, with uh, um, wh when you were signing up for it. Uh, and if we do have time, I will answer the questions um, that have just came in, and uh, if not, um, I will uh, answer you, well, I will include the answers within this presentation that will be shared with you at the, uh, well, within the next couple of days. So let's start with the first question. Um, I'll make, I will put my video here. Hopefully it will help. Uh, which of these products could be claimed and labeled vegetarian or vegan? So um, when it comes to um, these, uh, these slogans or these, these um, new, um, well, the, the, these, these new descriptors, um, there is often no legal definition uh, on an EU level. So similarly, in case of vegetarian or vegan, the EU does not define uh, vegetarian or vegan. However, some member states, such as uh, Germany, uh, France, Poland, um, they do have internal uh, rules on what can be uh, labeled as vegan and vegetarian. Basically, the, the rule is that vegan foods must not uh, be of animal origin and vegetarian uh, goods are similarly 
that cannot be of animal origin, uh, with the exception of milk, colostrum, eggs, honey, beeswax, propolis, and wool grease. Another, so even though this is a, um, or this is a requirement of uh, individual member states, um, the European law does um, consider this, or does cover this topic very, very broadly, basically by saying that uh, labeling should not be misleading to the consumer. Um, hence, uh, to answer the question, um, so I believe that cell-based meat is very unlikely to be allowed to be called a vegan or a vegetarian, uh, but it might, uh, there might possibly be um, other descriptors that could be used like cruelty-free or, or something else. Uh, on the other hand, um, um, cell-based uh, plants, fungi or algae, could potentially be labeled as vegan, uh, but this would depend on the production process um, of, the, of the food. The next question um, is, what about utilization of recombinant factor in the cell culture media? Will the product be categorized as GMO? So this depends. <laughs> in theory, um, you could use a, a genetically modified organism in the production of a, of a food um, and still fall within the scope of the novel food regulation. However, um, this would depend on the presence of the recombinant DNA in the final food. Um, if not present, then yes, you can, uh, it, then the food would not be categorized as a GMO. Uh, it would be categorized as a novel food. But if present, we would need to look at the reason why the, uh, the recombinant DNA is present and at the amount, that it, the, the amount that's included in the final food. Um, a, a similar question, a bit more specific, uh, refers to the impossible uh, food application. So uh, what do you think of the impossible food application and their decision to apply under Regulation 1829 from 2003? This is uh, the GMO regulation. Um, instead of claiming that food with GMO do not fall under that regulation, if proven that the protein enzyme does not contain GMO material. So to give you some background, um, the impossible meat, um, or the, one of the key ingredients of the impossible meat is heme. It's the protein that gives the meat-like flavor and texture. Uh, and this heme is de derived from uh, soy like hemoglobin, um, which is found, of course, in soy plants. Uh, however, in order to make uh, in order to make the um, in order to yeah to make heme in higher volumes, um, impossible inserts the DNA from the soy into a yeast, ferments it, and then um, um, uses the, the 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 produced heme for for their um, for their products. Um, so. In the, the final heme that they that they um, uh, that they have that they use for the for, for producing their their foods, there are some residual amounts of the production strain, uh, as well as <clears throat> uh, some residual amounts of the uh, recombinant DNA, uh, and because of that, the soy like hemoglobin. Um, still contains residual genetically modified material and therefore it would fall under the GMO regulation. Mm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the next question, uh, can a food be classified both as GMO uh, and novel food? If yes, should you get first the GMO authorization and then a novel food authorization? If not, once you get a GMO authorization, do you need to submit a novel food dossier if you want to use your approved GM food in other food matrices? So uh, basically, um, if a food is classified as a genetically, uh, as a made 
from a genetically modified organism, um, it would not fall within the scope of the novel food regulation. The novel food regulation, regulation 2015-2283, uh, says that um, genetically modified food, which is already covered by other union acts, should not fall within the scope of this regulation. So basically, genetically modified food would fall under the regulation of uh, uh, regulation 1829 from 2003. Um, so if a food could not be classified both as a GMO and a novel food, it's either one or the other. Mm. Are there restrictions on the type of cells to be used? Uh, I like these examples. Uh, I guess, for example, will the assessment be the same if you use spider muscle cells or cow eye cells or banana leaf cells? So <clears throat> there are, in theory, there are no restrictions uh, uh, on the type of cell that you use, uh, but uh, I do believe that it, uh, the application might be easier or a successful application might be easier for, um, <clears throat> cell, uh, for, for cell cultures derived from foods that are already consumed in the EU. So for example, uh, lab-grown uh, beef or lab-grown chicken. Um, is it easier to obtain an approval if your product is based on vegetable cells than on animal cells? Well, uh, not necessarily. So the requirements uh, are very similar. Um, and in both cases, the, um, well, the, the, the sorry, the, um, the requirements are very similar. Um, what I would say is, is key here is uh, the production process, and also, as I mentioned before, the uh, source organism. Um, if you can demonstrate substantial equivalence to a similar product already in the EU market, would that waive the need of some studies? So uh, this uh, depends on the specific case, um, I would say, but I, I believe it could. Um, However, uh, uh, again, it is important in, in any case to identify all the constituents of the food. It's not just about the main protein um, or the main component. It's uh, about all the, all the other uh, components. So uh, residues from the growth medium or, um, or some impurities and so on. Um, what should be required to characterize cell lines? Uh, so the basic information that should be provided include source organism taxonomic information, uh, origin and tissue parts of the source organism, uh, laboratory or culture co collection sourced, cell or tissue substrate used as a novel food, and the type of the culture. Will testing on animals be necessary? If yes, what kind of test? So <clears throat> in theory, uh, studies on animals could be avoided. Um, this will, of course, depend on the, uh, every individual case. Um, possible ways around uh, animal testing are uh, using other methods or um, basi basing the safety on, lit on literature. However, uh, it is crucial that uh, the food is characterized in as much detail as possible. Um, also, an example where study, animal studies could be omitted is uh, if the food is not absorbed. Um, however, if, if the food is absorbed or if... Um, if um, if other types of studies are, are avoiding these studies is not possible, the EFSA recommends uh, to take a tiered approach in which uh, the first step, the key uh, animal study, is the subchronic toxicity study. Um, and depending on the outcome of this, uh, of this trial, 
uh, additional uh, evaluations may, may be requested. Um, so this was the last question I received. Um, maybe let me check what are the questions uh, shared by, uh, by you in the chat and uh, maybe I can answer one or two quick ones. Mm. So what is the uh, average timeline from application to approval and the average cost of the process, including certifications and other requirements? So uh, the average timeline um, to, for, for approval, as I mentioned, is approximately, well, the best case scenario is one and a half years, but in, in reality, this is closer to two to two and a half years. Um, and the average cost of the process, uh, well, this really depends on, uh, on the actual food that you're trying to, um, uh, to authorize. Um, the biggest cost are the Uh, the biggest cost uh, are the um, toxicity studies, uh, which, um, well, again, it depends what kind of toxicity studies would have to be carried out or how many toxicity studies would have to be carried out. Um, and maybe one more. Uh, what is meant by providing positive and negative literature? Um, so that means um, that, well, when, when you look at literature, uh, some um, results of, of published studies may be favorable to your, um, to your product or to your application, and others may be unfavorable. Um, so a, favor, a, a favorable one would be one that supports safety, and an unfavorable or negative one would be one that raises some potential safety concerns. Mm. And the last one, um, have there been any cellular agriculture products that have been approved that have different amino acid sequence than already approved foods? Um, what is the difference between an EFSA assessment of a GMO a food that is exactly like an already existing food versus one that has different amino acid sequences than the existing food? Okay, so uh, let's start with the first part. Have there been any cellular agriculture products that uh, have been approved um, that have different amino acid sequences? Um, so they're uh, up to date uh, in the Europe, in the European Union, there have been uh, no cellular agriculture products approved um, to, to my knowledge. Um, what is the difference between an EFSA assessment of a GMO food as it, that is exactly like an already existing food? versus one that has different amino acid sequences than an existing food. Uh, I may have to follow up on this question um, because I'm not sure. Um, I will follow up on this question. So um, yes, uh, the, the time has come. We, we came to, to the end of this webinar. Um, thank you very much for taking uh, the time to attend. Um, the questions that I uh, didn't have enough time to answer, I will answer and uh, include in this presentation that will be shared with you shortly. And if you enjoyed the webinar uh, and found it useful, I would like to invite you to check uh, other, um, our other webinars that you can find on our website, uh, Pentec. Uh, uh, pentec-consulting.eu or on our YouTube channel. Um, also, feel free to contact me for any questions uh, that you may have and also any feedback or suggestions for topics in the future um, are very welcome. So, uh, yes, my email is here below and will be, uh, I will get in touch with you uh, 
uh, in regards to uh, the slides. So thank you very much once again. And